In order to discuss the reforms introduced in April 2012 and other proposals to alter the tribunal system, I spoke with Fiona Martin, Head of Employment at Martin Searle Solicitors. Fiona is a member of the Employment Lawyers Association Microfirms Working Party, tasked with providing feedback on the government's proposed changes to employment law. Fiona, the maximum levels of deposit orders and costs awards have been increased to deal with business concerns about weak claims. Do you think this was really necessary? Um, I don't really. In my experience, they're very rare. They're not widely used. Um, and actually, when it comes to vexatious claims, um, people will still pay those deposits, whatever. Um, there just needs to be stronger case management um, control by the judges rather than looking at payments. Um, and also in relation to cost orders, although the previous limit was 10,000, there was always the ability to claim more but to have your bill taxed. Um, and really enforcement is the main problem, if we're honest about it. We do get orders against, cost orders against claimants, but then we have the very expensive task of enforcing against them. And what are your thoughts on the idea of extending strikeout powers to judges in case management discussions? I think this would be... Uh, a bad step. Um, in many cases, particularly with unrepresented employees, uh, they would be very fearful of this case management and it also might encourage bullying tactics. Um, in my experience, judges don't always step in when another party is being unreasonable and perhaps threatening costs when they shouldn't be. I have experience in our own uh, local tribunal where the judges have been using their discretion to try and get employees to put their whole claim onto one A4 uh, piece of paper and that's something we've had to take to the EAT. Um, I think at the moment there are powers there to manage and also to deal with vexatious in, uh, claims and also defences as well because this is something that will be applied to respondents. The government is also taking steps requiring witness statements to be taken as read unless a judge or a tribunal directs otherwise. What are the advantages and disadvantages of this? I think that for employees, the ability to set out your case at the beginning does have the effect of calming and also ordering all the evidence so that by the time you come to cross-examination, they're then ready to answer questions. The downside, however, is that it does take a very long time and I think that what may be appropriate is where parties have agreed what is in dispute and what isn't is to then perhaps concentrate on those parts of the statement, have them read out and then go into cross-examination. Even though there was a lack of support for the proposal that judges should be able to sit alone in unfair dismissal cases, the government have brought this in now. What do you think about that? I think that it's a cost-saving exercise, probably very necessary because the tribunals are finding it very difficult to supply three people to sit on panels and quite often cases get postponed at the last minute. But I think there was always a feeling that to have someone who's got a practical experience of dealing with disputes in the workplace was very useful. And certainly when we see wing members taking lots of notes on particular issues, we feel encouraged by that because we feel that there is someone who does have that, that practical input talking to the judge and, and really influencing the decision. A further proposal in the consultation was that the qualification period for employees to be able to bring a claim for unfair dismissal should be extended from one to two years and this came in in April 2012. What were the reasons for this proposal? Well their reasons was that it was to give greater confidence to employers um, but when businesses had been questioned about the main barriers, they talked about health and safety. They certainly didn't talk about qualifying periods. Um, I think most practitioners are against this. Certainly most employers using six-month probation periods have more than enough time to decide whether this is someone who can do the job. Um, and they have the tools available to go through fair dismissal processes using the fair reasons for dismissal. The reform caused a lot of debate with unions and advice providers against it, arguing that this was actually against employees' rights. What other concerns did they have? I think in both employers and employees had concerns in the sense that it's unfair. Why should someone have to wait two years um, to have the right not to be unfairly dismissed? Also, we have a situation where it wasn't retrospective, so people moving jobs will be affected. 
um, and that may discourage movement. And I think in our country, I think we call it churn, we have five to six million people moving, um, and that can be a very productive thing. And I think from an employer point of view, if there's um, a dismissal which someone feels is unfair, there are so many reasons why you can get in under statutory exceptions or discrimination law, which would be very, very expensive to defend. Um, so I think for all reasons, it's, it's a, a retrograde step, really. So really, you think it would have been better just to leave it as the one year, leave it as it already was? Absolutely. I think that there has to be a sense of fair play and employers will be fighting more expensive whistleblowing claims, discrimination claims, and employees will feel upset that if they're treated unfairly, they won't have any recourse. It's certainly not good for employment relations in this country. Another proposal the government plans to introduce is the power for tribunals to impose financial penalties on employers breaching individual rights. What do you think about that? I think really it was the, the give to employee representatives uh, as opposed to all the other modifications that were coming in. I think that of course employers object to this. Uh, I think their points are that there's nothing there to reward those employers um, who have done the right thing. But I think with cost orders being made more and more against claimants, it would be the fair way, and as long as it wasn't just for technical breaches. But isn't this really just another way of the government making money? Yes, I think the feeling is that this is money that's going to be going to the exchequer, and surely where it's an employee's rights um, that have been breached, really that money should be going to the employee, not to the government. Another debate which is ongoing is the idea of charging tribunal fees to tribunal service users, which is due to be introduced from 2013. What do you think about that? I think it would just be another barrier to access to justice, um, particularly the options that they've put forward. We've been involved at our firm in, in filing our concerns um, because they're based on how much a claim is worth. Uh, therefore, the person that really has a high claim, perhaps because they've been discriminated against, will pay the most, and that doesn't seem to be right to me anyway. The suggested scheme of compensated no-fault dismissal has also caused some controversy. Can you explain what the proposals are in that regard? Yes, it's about the ability for employers and employees to have pr protected conversations um, where there's no-fault compensation. Um, there's many problems with that. I think the first one is that it's for micro-businesses where there's this magic number of 10. Um, but for many practitioners, we spend a whole day in tribunal arguing about whether people sh really are employees or whether they're casuals or freelancers. And I think it will cause more complex arguments. I think another point is that what could happen is that there, there would be the sort of talk where it's take this or else and some sort of bullying, although we already know that any issues around protected characteristics and equality issues would not be allowed to take place in protected conversations. So really, there could be really big arguments about whether an employer has 10 employees or more or less. Yes, and they are talking about only these micro-businesses having this ability. We have laws at the moment um, and case law on when people can talk about offering a compromise agreement. Uh, that's when there's an extant dispute, um, usually where there's some sort of dispute. Um, but what you don't really want is also people using these protected conversations to just get rid of people who they decide they don't like.